Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon. We're happy to have Daniel Alberg, who always finds the best of both worlds, uh, who will tell us about competing growth and earns. Thank you very much, Yuval, and thanks for the invitation and the opportunity to give a talk here. So, yes, this is going to be a talk on er competing growth and earns. And this is a joint work with some of my collaborators, uh, Simon Griffiths, Svante Johnson, and Rob Morris. OK, so competing gro growth has been studied in several contexts and uh, for a variety of reasons. For example, in the setting of first passage percolation, it was introduced in, uh, uh, in order to study the geodesic structure of, that, of the first passage metric. Uh, so here I'm going to study a somewhat different model, which has a, uh, a little bit different features, and I'm going to go right away and describe it. So it's going to be... Uh, a competition for space between two colors on set two. Uh, and the rules for this is going to be the following. So an uncolored site can, can take the color either red or blue, and that happens with rate one if it has precisely one infected neighbor of that color, or it will happen immediately if it has at least two infected colors of that uh, color. So an uncolored site turns red or blue at rate one if one red or blue neighbor or at uh, rate infinity if at least two neighbors. So uh, what we will observe here is that if say we start with one blue ball and or um, uh, one blue site and one red site is that they're going to be growing. And this effect here of uh, instant infections when you have more than two colors already is going to make that you're, not, you're never going to see any inside corners that will span out immediately. If you have one red and one blue, what does it do? Then it's just at rate one. So it has to be at least two of the same color. So if there's one red and one blue, it's still just rate one, you turn red, and rate one, you turn blue. So what will happen you here... never have two red neighbors and two blue neighbors at the same time. No, that's never going to happen. Yeah. And if it happens, that means that the guy is surrounded anyways, so whatever color he takes, it won't matter for the, for the remaining of the process. <laughs> but, but, but in any case, you just get, you know, you get one uh, thing happening according to the first rule, and then some cascade happens instantly. Yes, it? yes. So since, uh, since since there's only going to be one nucleation at a the time, then uh, it, you never end up in that situation unless it's in your already starting configuration. So after some time, this will evolve, and maybe the uh, blue has grown out to occupy this space, and the red has grown out maybe to occupy this part, and exactly how it looks here in the interface between the two, it doesn't really matter because what will uh, determine the continuation of the process is just 
the boundary. Uh, so typically you will have the each monochromatic thing look like a rectangle, but there will be some competition here, and you will have so, see these inside corners. Uh, so the, the question we ask is, what happens as time goes to infinity? Can both colors coexist, or will we have one ending up surrounding the other? So in first passage percolation, if you look at this, some competing growth for first passage percolation model, we know already that there is positive probability that two colors can survive. Um, and in this model, we have some more, we have some bootstrap effect that somehow bounces out the shapes like this. And uh, that will have some effect on the growth, of course. And uh, the question is whether the answer will be the same or will it be a different answer and how does one prove that? So, what will happen is that, well, this side will grow out in this direction and it will be affected, it will depend on how long the sides of its neighbors is, but that, that's how, what kind of causes him to grow. And in the same, at the same time, this will grow, but will be kind of blocked by this guy who's trying to grow in the other direction. So one somehow has to take into consideration all these, um, all these factors and see, uh, what will happen. And one can write down a system of differential equations which somehow says that this is what ought to happen. And trying to throw around the terms, one can see that what, what somehow governs the growth is like the length of the perimeter of red and length of perimeter of blue. But then in order to try to use that to say something about uh, what eventually will happen, one has to also somehow compare because like these areas are more more somehow important than what happens around here, because here is where you really try to eat up your neighbor. Um, so, uh, you have a guess for the answer to your question? It, no. could, I ask a, could I ask a question? Sure. Um, are there only finitely many sort of overall shapes that you can have. I mean, one shape is these two rectangles like you've drawn, yeah. but then maybe one has three sides or something. Are, yeah, are you can have something like... ...things that can happen? Like this, yeah. Yeah, you will have... There's always an octagon. Yeah. Unless you somehow have this situation where you only get six somehow edges. And so you can have something like this, and then red could... Oh, the blue could also grow out in this direction, and somehow then you would have these two inside like that. But. Those are the only things that can happen. Yep, so the, so the answer to the question will be that the answer is no, yes. You cannot have coexistence. So, so theorem, the two color, uh, competing A uh, growth model has almost surely a single survivor. Uh, yes. So before I, here we come already to the first open problem. I promised I will have several open problems for you. And the first open problem is, what happens with three colors? We do not know what the answer is for three colors. And that may sound a little bit ridiculous, and it is a little bit ridiculous because we know that four colors cannot coexist. So in fact, any even number of colors cannot coexist, but odd number of colors we do not know. So would you say they cannot so at least one of them will die out. Exactly. And the reason for this is that if, if, you, if you have something where you have, say, 
alternating stretches of colors. Could look something like that. Uh, what you always can do, if there are an even number of colors, you can always go along the boundary and just recolor them alternatingly. Because this stretch of blue, he knows that, oh, next to him, I have some other color to, on each side. But this guy over here, I don't know which color he is. I just know that he's different from that guy because there's an inside corner here. But I, I can't tell whether he has my color or someone else's color. So you can always recolor everything into two colors. And since we can solve this, I said here we start with one and one, but we could start with any finite initial configuration, and the answer is the same for two colors. So knowing that, we could also handle this situation where we would have more colors. But three colors is still an open problem. Simulations uh, show that uh, there's no coexistence? We have no simulations, but I tell you that it sounds pretty ridiculous if uh, the parity of the number of colors should actually determine the outcome. Uh, but no, I don't have any simulation. Uh, okay, so before I come to talk about the proof of, that, of this, I'm going to describe something else. And this is where the urns come, come in. And it's going to be something that I call a competing urn scheme. So we're going to have a competing urn scheme on a finite connected graph. So we start with finite connected graphs. On each vertex, we put an urn. And each urn can contain either red or blue balls. But they can't contain both colors at the same time. So in, in, uh, so in uh, this competing earth scheme here, what will happen is at discrete times now, uh, I will first, I will pick a ball uniformly among all balls in the system. Second. Uh, I will return the ball to where I took it, but I will also place a copy of that ball to each of its neighbors, each of the neighboring urns. And finally, I said that red and blue are not allowed to be in the same urn at the same time. So if I attempt to place a red ball in an urn where there are already blue balls, they will annihilate. So the red will annihilate with one of the blue, and therefore I, the effect is that I actually remove the ball, so the number of balls will decrease in that time step. So this is the competing urn scheme. And one, yes? So a ball uniformly, not a vertex uniformly, so No, a ball uniformly among all balls in the system. So all, so all, so all balls play the same role, they have equally important, independent of their colors. Return and place competing neighboring. Yeah. In all the neighboring ones. Yeah, so we have some graph, maybe it looks like this. And if I pick a ball from this urn, I will look at it, what color has it, I'll put it back. If it was blue, then I put 
one blue in each of the neighboring urns as well. What's and the, what's the initial configuration of urns? Uh, there's one urn at each uh, vertex, and then I start with uh, some number of red or blue balls in each urn. And uh, I can say, for example, I might want to start with one red here, one blue there, or something else. But they are monochromatic in one in urn? Each urn? Yes, each urn is monochromatic. But the number of balls in it, it's completely arbitrary? Yeah, could be arbitrary. Okay. Finite, but arbitrary. And you don't uh, place a copy, a new copy, in the same urn? No, I just return the ball that I looked at, and then I just put and guys the names the neighbors. And the reason why I do this will be apparent now, because the observation I'm going to tell you about next is that uh, this competing growth model I described first is exactly this urn scheme on the cycle of length 8. happens to have eight sides, or...? Uh, Otherwise, it's oh, not uh, a cycle? No, uh, well, in this case, it's not a cycle of length eight, but here it's still a cycle of length eight. And I, I will tell you about it. Uh, so you said that it's a passively lambda cycle? Yes. So with that initial seed, it will be... Yeah, on that initial seed, we will have the cycle 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And uh, the initial setting where I have one blue and one red, it will correspond to the case where I have one blue here, one blue here, one blue here. And then I have one red here, one red here, and one red here. And these two are initially vacant. So what, what I have here, I have only encoded the length of the perimeters of the different guys. So length one, length two, length one, uh, length one, length one, length one, length one, length one, length one. And here I have two latent sides will only pop up when I have something growing here. So how do you tell whether you have a latent side? If you by looking at the shape? If you have a... Uh, well, it can only be... change columns. Yeah, so there's always something in between where I have go from blue to red. Okay, but then in that picture of you would have ten sides. Here? Yeah. No. Okay. I, I'm well, still you only have, have eight real sides. So sides are alternating horizontal and vertical, uh, yes. except, so, 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 uh, so except again, the, the, question, the question was how, from looking at the shape, how do you decide whether you have a latent side? So you said it's whenever you change from red to blue. Yeah. Exactly. Without if yeah, it's horizontal here. Okay, without so, changing direction. Y yes. Okay. That's so as Omar said, there's always uh, horizontal and vertical, horizontal, vertical, and so on. So if you don't see that, then something is wrong, and that means there's a latent side. Yeah. So, uh, and why is this the correct uh, way, the correct model? Well, what would happen here if, if this side would advance one step? Uh, well, it does proportional to its length. So if the length is the number of balls in the urn, then he will get, uh, jump one step, his length will remain the same, but it will increase the length of his neighbors. And it's the same if this one would advance one side, he will increase this neighbor by one, uh, no, uh, yeah, he will increase this neighbor by one, but he will also eat up his blue neighbor by one. So it's a, uh, it's rather straightforward to convince oneself that this actually is just the same process. So, that, so you're using the fact that the same color corners are convex and the op opposite color corners are concave. Yes. Uh, I mean, if, you had, if, if, the, if in the top left it was red, red, then red would eat red. Yeah. Yes. But you don't get that. No, you, you, you never get that because you somehow always have this you can't. where there's... Uh, yeah. 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 And is this equivalent to for any number of colors? So for any number of colors, yes, you can uh, do the same, yes. 
but the but the the graph will change. So so for example here it depends on it's some multiple of uh, whatever you have, right? So uh, so here you have one, two, three, four, five, six different colors. I guess it would be C eighteen or something like that. But you just have to you just have to do accounting, right? With more colors, couldn't you end up with a non-convex shape? I mean, couldn't you have like a C shape? Uh, yes, it doesn't necessarily have to be convex. But what you will see is that, uh, well, this isn't never, convex to begin you never, with. You never close it. Well, you could close in, and then the, uh, everything collapses. The evolution collapses, but that can only happen finitely many times. Yes. And then you restart. So that's what... That is something that can happen, but it can only happen finitely many times, and the last time it happens, then you will just have be in a situation like this, and here it cannot happen. So here, you would, what can happen is that this happens. From here, you can go to some situation where, uh, where it looks like this, and red is here in between, and then eventually blue could close in on red, and then, of course, everything collapses, but we don't care because I know that red doesn't exist anymore. So, uh, theorem two. Is that uh, for any finite connector graph, the competing Ern scheme will have only one winner. That's with two colors, of course. With two colors. Yeah, so I should emphasize that for two colors. Yes. And uh, another observation is that um, there's a reason why we can't prove this theorem for three colors. And our proof goes to this theorem which is more general because it considers any finite connected graph. But theorem two is in general false for three colors. Um, and I will give you the counterexample. Mm -hmm. You could take the following graph. And if you start with these two guys red, these blue, and these two green, and you may assume that they have a large number in each of these components, and the that they are also very equal. So what will happen if red is trying to conquer the others? He will first have to ha get a good advantage here in, in the middle. But while doing so, he somehow have to compete against two other of his opponents, which, is, which are equally strong. So for him to grow large here in the middle, he has to have like a large excursion of a, very neg of a random walk with a very negative drift. And that's unlikely to happen. So the center keeps coming back to zero. Yes, exactly. So theorem two is general false for three colors. And then the obvious open question. Then, but we still would expect for some graphs, three colors to be able to coexist. And in particular, what happens for the cycle? Cycle is interesting because it's really what corresponds to the first model. So uh, 
Open question number two. Uh, may three colors coexist on the cycle. Cycle of arbitrary length now. And even better, could you even give us like a criteria for, for, for graphs for when you can have three colors coexisting and when you cannot? So the relationship between these two open problems. Yeah, so this if would you, involve, this would involve. Yeah, so if you can do that problem for the cycle, then you do this problem. Well, if, you, well, if, if the answer was no, which way around? <laughs> ah, or the other way, way around. Well, if the answer to that is no, then the answer to that is no, is that right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. In particular, any two annihilate here, there's no, you could have some, also some graph on the colors and have some color, no. So here you wrote red and blue annihilate, but yep. no, three colors, any two annihilate. Any, any two annihilate, exactly, one. yes. You could think of, you know, have some colors to coexist. red, you know, blue and green coexist peacefully, but they both annihilate. Red, that would kind of reduce to yeah, two. But then blue and green would just combine. Yes. Then you could see them as the same. Yeah, but for more right. complex graphs. Or you uh, could have a situation where only you need points. three balls of the different colors before any annihilation occurs. Yeah, you could also do something like that. Uh, OK. So let's have a look at how we do to prove this, what we can prove. And then it will become more evident also why, why we do, why well, our proof works for two colors, but it doesn't work for three colors. Okay, so our, our first proof of, of, of this uh, theorem, it uh, included like a, we used this uh, uh, language of stochastic approxima approximation algorithms, if you know what that is, which essentially like random sequences, which you can split into a martingale part and a drift part, which, and the martingale part gets weaker and weaker over time, so it will disappear in the end. And then when that happens, you somehow will, uh, the, the drift term will tell you where you will end up based on some uh, vector field which leads you to some local attractor. However, there's a problem with that approach because uh, it, it requires you to know that you, the number of balls in your system is growing linearly. And when the underlying graph is a regular graph, we managed to, to prove that. But when the graph is not regular, it was more complicated. So after a while, we ended up with this other proof where we instead are going to embed our system again in continuous time and we'll use techniques from branching process theory. So first step of the proof, embed into continuous time. And let y of t be the vector that counts number of red minus number of blue at each side. And here already see why it works for two colors because we can count red positively, blue negatively, but what, how would you do for three colors? You would have to have some, another dimension. So here, when you say embedded, you mean every ball has a Poisson clock? When exactly, exactly. So, 
So have assigned a Poisson clock to the scroll, <coughs> and then now, of course, everything will be growing exponentially fast, but it's just like an embedding continuous time, and results will be the same. It's just technicality. And, uh, uh, and this, of course, at time t. So, well, we show that if I take the limit as time goes to infinity of e to the minus lambda t, or what I will explain soon what lambda is, we will have a limit which will be some random variable times pi, almost surely, where lambda and pi are uh, lambda is the Perron Fabinius eigenvector of uh, the adjacent matrix of the graph. Eigenvalue. Eigenvalue, sorry. And pi is the eigenvector, the corresponding eigenvector. And w, random variable, and the probability that w equals zero that happens with probability zero. Uh, and this is precisely what tells you then, this is condition that says that really the, the number of walls in the system grows linearly, that this random variable here cannot uh, be zero. Yes, so it tells you that, okay, the, on the long term you will have somehow the number of walls would be some random number, which would be either positive or negative. Positive, if red is the winner, then red will be and will distribute according to some pro proportionally to the Perron Frobenius eigenvector. And if W instead is negative, it means that blue won. And we can make this conclusion precisely because this random vector, uh, this eigenvector is known to have all entries strictly positive. So proving this proves the theorem. Theorem two. Um, and so let me first comment on that we know that this holds if we only have one color. So if we only have one color, then there's no annihilation. And uh, the process here is just a multi type branching process in continuous time. And then from, from the classical theory for Markov. Uh, branching processes, we know that this limit exists and this is a random variable which is non-zero, almost surely. So uh, what we need to do is somehow argue why this also holds in our case when we have a annihilation in the system. And it's the annihilation which uh, is a little bit complicated and how we'll handle it is by actually converting the system into a conservative system where we don't have any annihilation anymore. So I will do that by instead of annihilating red and blue points, I will just merge them into forming a purple ball instead. And then I will take, I will continue looking after the purple ball so I, to help me out in the, in the process. So by, by doing this, what I do is I somehow couple the balls. I have a red and a blue, like red nucleated eats a blue, but okay, I will keep both of them, but I somehow couple them so they will in the future, they will always have descendants at the same time. So we look at a conservative system. Uh, so red plus blue equals purple. Is it two purple? Oh. No, one purple. It doesn't matter, right? Okay. One purple. Um, and, uh, well, it does matter a little bit, but one purple, yes. <laughs> For what I'm going to do, do, one purple. <laughs> okay. What do you think? It's not too late to change your mind. <laughs> no, I want Just one purple. <laughs> okay, so let R of T be of T and P of t be vectors counting these balls. So where is it? 
In what sense? It, there, there's something is conserved, but yeah, it's not. Yeah, so instead, instead of an annihilating the red and blue, I still keep them in the system, but as purple balls. And purple, I didn't say, purple do not interact with red and blue. So once two balls merge to form a purple ball, they will, uh, they will not interact more with the remaining balls in the system. They will continue to give descendants according to their now common Poisson clock, but they will not interact with the red and blue balls in the system. So the what is conserved? I don't. What is conservative here? Uh, it means that I don't annihilate the balls. I will keep them in the system. But you annihilate one of them. Yeah, no, I merged them. <laughs> but the number, the number, the number is of balls increases. No, nothing. the number is not conserved. Nothing is. In fact, the thing is going. I mean, I for example, you could just increase the number of. You could have two red balls. Yeah, but okay. So think of each purple ball as two. Then the, the, the number is. Another conserved. thing that could happen is you just add two red balls to the system. Uh, yes. So, so in some sense, nothing is conserved. You so can change the number of... The mass of the well, purple ball is twice as the mass yeah. of an ordinary ball, so yeah. mass is conserved. No, but I can no, increase but, mass by just adding two red balls. <laughs> uh, the the, the yeah. process has a lot of increase of mass. Because but but yeah. when That's when red ball, if he nucleates and produces two, two uh, red balls, then maybe one is, has to merge with the blue one, form a purple one, but it's still there. I, th I think the objection is to the word conservative. Ah, okay. Doesn't yeah, of to course, be everything is going to be increasing. Concerned. But I mean, yeah. as soon as you have a nucleation, everything is increasing. Yeah. I mean, okay, so conservative maybe is the wrong word, but it just There's means no that annihilation. no annihilation anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, okay. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but the observation here is that if I just count all the red plus the purple, well, that is just the number of balls I would have if there were no blue in the world. So, in particular, since I know that a monochromatic system, that I have some convergent, convergence, multiplying by e to the lambda t, this converges to some random variable wr times this eigenvector. But at the same time, if I just count blue plus purple, that's the number of blue I would have if there were none no red from the beginning, this will also have to converge to some variable wb, and this happens almost surely. Uh, the good thing about this is that what I'm trying to track is the number of red minus the number of blue, which I can just take by taking differences here. So this implies that uh, e to the minus lambda t y of t is just e to the minus lambda t red minus blue, which then will have to converge to wr minus wb times pi. So we have convergence. And it also shows it's a martingale. It's a difference of two non-negative martingales, which is a martingale just changing sign. Yeah, I guess. I guess. But WR and WB are not independent. No, they're not independent. They're certainly de uh, dependent. Uh, so, which means that I cannot directly conclude that WR minus WB cannot be zero. Precisely. And that's something that's missing still. And that's going to be the third step of the proof, essentially. And the last step of the proof, because once we know that, we're done. So in the third step, we need to show that uh, this limit is non-zero. Uh, and how will we do that? Well, now we'll need to include, include another ingredient. So we, what we're going to do is essentially just condition on what happens in the first nucleation. So in the first nucleation, I'll pick a red or a blue. Let's assume it's a blue ball. And the ball will nucleate. And I will mark each of his 
descendants. And his descendants will have marks on them, and their descendants will in the future also have marks on them. So I will keep track of them separately. So the descendants of this blue that was created in the first nucleation? Uh, uh, no. Uh, yeah, uh, so I pick a ball, a blue ball. I will not mark him, but he will produce offspring, and I will put a mark on each of his offspring. Also the purple uh, balls? What? Also the purple balls? Uh, the paper? What you say? If, if a marked blue ball uh, ah, for a purple, with a red ball. Yes, the purple will also keep the mark. Yes. And a purple marked will also have descendants which are marked. So the marks are kept for all descendants. Uh, so well, why will I do that? Because in, the, in one nucleation, I can only give rise to one color. So if the, if the first one was blue, then this will be blue. So keeping track of them separately will guarantee that we will have convergence to something like this, which we know is non-zero, because it's monochromatic. So, mark balls of first uh, nucleation. And all their descendants. So for marked balls, what will happen? Well, if I, let's call them M of T, the marked balls. If I multiply by this, then they will converge again to some random variable uh, w, B, if we assume that they're, they're blue. Uh, and then I w if I just also track, if I just suppress the first nucleation, so I marked uh, everything here, and if I just ignore them and keep track of the system without that first nucleation, it will just evolve at the system where the first nucleation was suppressed, and it will converge again to this random variable here just with a time delay, right? Because I somehow suppress it for, for some random time, and then it will just uh, differ by a positive constant. Is this in the conservative system or the original system? These statements that you're making now? Oh, I, I'm making this system in the conservative system. So we, we're working in this system for the, for the reminder of the proof. Um, yes, so for, if I look at the system with first suppression, first nucleation suppressed. Then I will have something e to the minus lambda t, y, call it, put it a tilde on it. Uh, this will converge to some, uh, put a prime here because it's a copy of that w there times some e to the minus, uh, or, yeah, e to the minus lambda tau, some random time for the first nucleation to occur, times this vector. But if I also somehow keep track of everything at once, I will still have the just the regular system, competing system, conservative. Mark, I, I have, still have a problem with the marked ball. Okay. The one that you return, the, the ball that you returned is not, doesn't get the mark. No. Only the, so why do you, do you get exact? So the mark board would be smaller than all of the blue board. Why do you get the same variable? Oh, it, it's not necessarily the same. But for any uh, initial config, it depends on the initial configuration. So it certainly depends on where those balls landed. So it depends on which ball that nucleated. So it, it, it but that's not the It's not the same WB as you have there. No. That's my no. Maybe you it's can WN. Put WN. Yes, now I'm not sure. Perfect. Yes, so it's a different random variable, but the important thing is probability of this random variable being zero is zero. Uh, and this random variable here is a copy of this random variable have the same distribution. So, uh, but if I would keep track of everything at once, then uh, all this system would also evolve 
as and have this limit. So what if I manage to do that, what, what will happen is that I um, that uh, I have well w pi that's the limit of e to the minus lambda t y of t but this is the same as just the superposition of the suppressed configuration plus the marked balls which will converge to uh, w m plus w prime e to the minus lambda to pi. So somehow I get a relation between this guy and these guys. I am not being precise enough for all of this to make sense now. I'm going to make that clear because what can happen here is that um, I, I need to make the marks jump around a little bit. The reason is that what could happen is that, okay, so imagine that here I have a blue, he has two neighbors, but his neighbors, at least one of his neighbors is red. What the other is doesn't matter. Uh, but now imagine that he is the first to nucleate, so he will pr produce marked offspring, but I will also I'll keep track of this marked balls, I will keep track of the suppressed system, I will keep track of the whole system. So if I want to keep track of the whole system, I need the offspring he places here to annihilate with one of the red, the former purple, which will affect what happens in the, in the suppressed system. So for example, when, when there, at a later time comes another blue, which is not from a descendant of the first nucleation, and wants to annihilate with that red, which isn't there anymore, I have to somehow allow that the two blue that are there, one that's marked and one that's not marked, they change so that the unmarked blue actually pairs with the red instead. So the marks, if there's a purple marked ball in the same urn as a blue ball which is not marked, the mark has to change to the, to the blue ball. blues. Blues grab the marks from the purple. Yes. So that, that's an additional rule I need to, to make this correct. Well, but the point is, if I have this, since I know that this guy is non-zero, so W prime and W cannot be zero at the same time. But since they have the same distribution, it importantly means that we we'll probably let most one half, they can be zero. So this implies that probability w equals zero is less than or equal to one half. So the, uh, one thing is w here equal to yeah. w m plus w prime e to the minus lambda tau sig sigma. E minus lambda tau. Okay. Yeah. And tau itself has a continuous distribution. distribution. So doesn't that already tell you that? W has it from um, So W is the sum of these two terms. Mm -hmm. And tau is independent of anything. So if you condition on WM depends and WM, w right. what? WM depends on. Yeah, so I think these guys are not uh, uh, independent. And I, I don't think I can make that no, but, conclusion. But, uh, but tau is independent of everything. No. Uh, normalization is that? So is the time of the first nucleation. Nucleation. So the time at which WM starts to. And, and you're also somehow conditioning on the nucleation being a blue. So it's all. Okay. what has the same. So what did you say has the same distribution, W prime and. Yes, W and W prime. I mean, that's not promising. I mean, even conditioning on Tor. Tor does it influence W, but you've got, then you can look at the time of the second nucleation, which is a. It, oh, well, it seems like you still have some continuous randomness. Mm -hmm. 
Why, why don't we let him yeah. show us the, the existing proof before? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, may, maybe it's possible to do it like that. Uh, but anyways, from this, it's very easy to also to uh, reach the conclusion. Uh -huh. Because what we will do now is we will have this here holds, and it has to hold independent of the starting configuration. So you can... Why did you say that uh, this is less than half? Because if uh, this thing has to be equal to this over here, and uh, that guy and that guy have the same distribution, then neither of them can be... Because WM is never, it's never zero. Never zero. It's the result of the monochromatic uh, evolution. Uh, and this happens independently of the initial configuration. So, uh, in particular, we will apply now Levy zero one law that says that, like, the more and more you observe of your system, the more certain you're going to be of the outcome. So, it really, you would converge to, like, the uh, uh, the indicator of of this event. And if, but if that indicator cannot be more than one half, then has to be only on a null set that you really have zero as the limit. So, so result follows. From uh, if the probability was positive, then you could one. condition on so some initial uh, some initial evolution where the, then the probability would be 0.9. Conditional probability. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. Um, but this is true no matter what position. So I, maybe I would need to give some more details in order to precisely convince you that this is a proof. But I will not do that because I also want to uh, end with a few more open problems. So. What is really interesting, we think, is that uh, first the connection between the growth model and the competing earn scheme. But then also, this model is quite interesting in its own right. You can ask many questions for, for the competing earn scheme. So I already said two questions about open problem uh, when it comes to the existence of, or the coexi possible coexistence of three or more colors. Uh, but other problems, other open problems, uh, concern what happens for the competing earn scheme now. For example, if you study it on set D. So, This is how you prove that you're doing pure math. Right? <laughs> the applied mathematician. <laughs> Why is it? Yeah, but uh, it's it's interesting, I think, because you can put uh, you can ask many questions, which all relate quite a lot to other no models. Which, uh, for example, if you start with just one ball at the origin on set D, how will the evolution look like? You will have some exponential growth in the volume, but how will the spread look like? And somehow it's 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 an interesting question to try to determine what happens. So you're even on Z, right? It's yeah, even in one dimension. And, and that's more relevant to the cycle that you started. Yep. So. Yep. So even in one dimension, there's non-trivial questions to ask. And uh, to focus here on the uh, competing aspect is that what happens if you start with two balls, one red and one blue, on it could even be on on Z. And is there a possible probability for coexistence, or is it not? And, uh, well, let's start writing the problem. So for one initial red and one blue, uh, on said D, is the positive probability for coexistence. Uh, 
And uh, so in one dimension, you would have something like this. Uh, well, you will have some interfacing between the two at some point. And then you would have something that looks like that, perhaps. And you would have... What? Yeah, you have two colors. Okay. Yes. <laughs> uh, yeah. One blue and one red. So what should happen here? Well, the volume should grow exponentially, right? Because you have this in continuous time. But the, the growth horizontally should still be linear. And uh, it seems to be, uh, it's, it's not uh, clear what would happen if there's actually a possibility for, for both colors to uh, coexist in this model, even on the line. Because it's not as in first passage percolation where, well, once they're separated, they will, there's no interaction anymore. But here, like, what, what the one that's stronger could come and gradually eat up the other. That will be a very slow process in the beginning, if they're rather equal. But the question is, what happens over time? We, and we don't really know. Uh, what will happen with this interface here? Will, will, maybe it's the case that there is positive probability for both to survive indefinitely, but that somehow one should maybe have an advantage and maybe somehow have an interface pushing in that direction. But it, it really is not an easy question, because it depends very much what or how the interface looks here, like, well... I mean, one cannot have an advantage. I mean, it's, it's impossible to have two of them survive and the interface moving to the left. Uh, actually, the simulation seems to suggest that it is. <laughs> but is that neurogothic theory tell you that's impossible? I mean, if you had positive probability of... I don't see why that should be impossible. Yeah. No, and it, in order to try to answer these questions, somehow one would have to understand, I think, what, what happens here on the, on the boundary between the two. So, like, is this something that is very slow, low, and one rather quickly eats up the other, or will they be rather high, and somehow it's, it's hard to, it seems hard to actually come up with an answer. So. Uh, to begin with, is there a positive probability for, for coexistence? And if so, uh, what can be said about the interface? Um, instead of starting with here, like two balls or a finite number of balls, uh, in the beginning, one could start with an infinite number of balls. For example, we could start at each side. We could toss a coin to determine whether to place one red ball or one blue ball. Then we start with a random configuration in the whole, uh, on the whole lattice. And as uh, time evolves, this is more, looks more similar to maybe like a Glauber dynamics or something like that. Uh, and in Glauber dynamics, there's a big open question whether whether you will stabilize in all pluses or all minuses. And you can ask the similar question here. So if the coin you use in the beginning is biased, so for p larger than half, p probability of being red, is it the case that you, in, uh, each urn eventually turns out to be all red for uh, all future? Or will it be that you fluctuate between red and blue infinitely many times? And natural conjecture would be that for p larger than one half, you would stabilize at blue. But for p equal to one half, you should fluctuate in between being red or blue. Right. So, so that's a setting where ergodic theory tells you something, right? Everything, now it's everything is translation invariant. Yes. Now, now there's hope for ergodic theory. 
So it could. So maybe but that can tell you then that it has to fluctuate because but it's not stationary time. No, because it's you have in space. you have you have the volume growth. You, oh, you, okay. you you not have just one guy at each position, but like somehow the law of everything changes over time. So I don't think you directly could get like a sheep answer to to the question. Well, which to which query? So so it can if it all becomes. Uh, could you have you, could you have some of the lattice becoming settling on red and another point settling on blue? Oh, no. Because uh, uh, then suppose they are neighbors, then they would keep uh, somehow. Yeah. Uh, the one one would have to dominate yeah. the other. Maybe so you would have to have these clusters uh, of red and blue. But we're, we're on Z. Yeah. You can have on Z. You can have. <laughs> right. Well, in the limit, you just see all the right. So, so if you what? I mean, if you run time for, you know, have had a large time, you'll either see a really big red window or a really big blue window around you, but it doesn't tell you what happens when you yeah, fix so the time and then look on a really big scale. Yeah. So, the, yeah, since typically we see larger and larger component, Supposedly, but mm -hmm. what what will happen with the boundary in between those components? They can grow maybe slower and slower and slower, or like move slower but and slower and slower. Thing, it's yeah. possible that in the limit, with some probability everything is red, and with some probability everything is blue. Yes, I think uh, because this you know the event that everything is eventually red, but there's an event that every side is red. Uh -huh. That event is is shift invariant. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, so, might, so it has to fluctuate, but you have yeah. to. But, but it could weakly converge to a mixture of all that and all right. black, like anything. Yeah. Well, so just to, okay. to say that in the case that P is larger than a half, we actually know the answer, and the only answer is that you fixate on all red eventually. We each site with probability one fixate. So let me just finish by writing this down. So another theorem. Uh, uh, toss p biased coin to determine whether to place red or blue at each site independently. If P is strictly larger than a half, then each site fixates at red, almost surely. So question, what about P equals one half? So I'm going to end there, and then we can continue to discuss then whether these problems can be solved or not. So what are the possibilities for people to have on C? Uh, Yes, yeah, so I, maybe I didn't emphasize, but this is in this is in set D for any dimension. Right? So uh, and the question here is also for set D in any dimension, and for for Z, well, it could, it's unclear, but so you should you should have something that like your your uh, components, monochromatic components, they should be growing and growing, and growing and become bigger. Uh, but every side should go back and forth infinitely many times. From yeah, but it's somehow, it's but hard to say. It's more and more you, you need to say something about the drift of the interfaces, right? So typically, they should be, behave some, some random walk or something like that, be going back and forth. But it could be somehow that they, the randomness in this somehow stabilizes and that you, you only have like a finite uh, phratic variation or something like that, so you somehow 
get sure, trapped. But, then, but, but that's the first question. So it's not a, it doesn't seem like it's a theorem that, that sites cannot fix out. Right. Oh, see. It can't. Right. So so this I is think it's so, so what's the right. proof? Because well, the probability that red fixates is either zero or one. No, no. Yeah, but you know, everything right. fixates. But maybe everything fixates to, to, to different colors. Maybe so uh, two, no, two, no, 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 because if you have an interval, so prove it. So if you have an interval uh, that fixates on red uh, next to an interval that fixates on blue, so so the growth uh, will be determined. The growth of the numbers will be determined by the length of the intervals. So there will be a drift. Uh, there is a drift uh, from the longer interval towards. Interval this doesn't sound like a proof. This what sounds like a heuristic so argument, uh, and I agree. But but, no, so but it seems like it's 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 well, so. <laughs> no, I mean, if you have just these two neighbors that are, they would have to. If one is bigger than the other, he he kills the bigger one. Kills yeah, the but they're one. both growing, and, yeah, and they're maybe exactly they're the just time. kind of keeping pace with each other. Yeah. Yeah, both some scale. Growing. I mean, everything's growing. So, so if you have a, an interval that fixates from blue, then uh, the growth rate within the interval, uh, this eigenvalue lambda, will depend on the length of the interval as well as on what happens on the adjacent intervals. Yeah, so it's not like in, in lab dynamics where you... I don't believe it's a thing. <laughs> yeah, so in lab dynamics when, when you and each po time point you have like a... when you update, you have a probability of updating to either thing, but now like on the time interval at which this happens in this model, since the, the number of balls is growing, then uh, it, it doesn't stay stationary over time, and uh, I, I very much agree with the heuristic argument, but I do not have a proof. Okay. So one okay. thing I can, I can mention, so I was, have been working on a related problem uh, with Brett Kolesnik, a student at UBC, so I'm not sure if you'll meet him next week, but uh, it's essentially uh, equivalent to what we were doing also as well. Uh, one thing that uh, we can uh, more or less show, if you look at the interface in this starting with one and one blue, mm -hmm. we can show that the interface essentially moves at a linear speed. We don't know that it's possible to have coexistence. Uh, simulations as I said, suggest uh, that it is. Okay, that's interesting. But, uh, but it's hard to simulate this for uh, extended uh, yes. length of time. Uh, and so you've proven uh, if the interface exists in a straight line? Uh, uh, in a certain sense, uh, we, the interface has to be to move at a linear speed. It's uh, possibly random and seemingly also random. Uh -huh. But you know that there is some convergence to like some constant, some, or do you know uh, it well, just have a, a, a lower bound? It's a slightly weaker statement, but uh, okay. but yes, it's interesting. Yeah, so then one would have to compare that velocity to the velocity which the front moves, which... Oh, it's, uh, yeah, it's smaller than the velocity. Okay, I think we should yeah. make it the room, we can continue this. So for three colors, I mean, even just on a triangle, do you know? Three well, in a triangle, well, you have to kill one, because once you nucleate, you will kill your, uh, your neighbor, so the number of balls will decrease until you... Oh, but you might start with, like, a minute. Yeah, but you still have to decrease until you have... Uh, the total number of balls will be de decreasing until so you have your neighbors are of the same color. So if you have three colors, 